Majora's Mask, Chapter 4 The Second Day Rain pattering on the windows. It came down in sporadic downpours as it had ever since the early morning. Footsteps up and down the staircase and across the hallway. Someone was pacing back and forth, maybe with as much on their mind as him. Thunder, rumbling in the distance. The mountain dweller sleeping outside of the hotel's front doors had been right about today's storm. A sad, adolescent Deku scrub lying on the bed of his hotel room, staring up at the ceiling and listening to all these pointless noises. That was himself. At first, he'd blame the fairy's departure on Tattle's bossy, controlling, irrational self, but she'd made some good points. Ever since he'd come through the great wooden doors to Clock Town, he'd been following her around like a puppy, as if he was the fairy. While Tattle's departure was undoubtedly rude, it was only practical. Wasn't he only slowing her down by forcing her to keep him company? Ah, she was right, he thought. I can't do anything right now. He'd woken up for the second time that day, lying on his bed in defeat for over an hour. Food? Link eventually thought. Yeah, I should eat food. He tried not to acknowledge a faint hope that Tattle would be waiting outside. The Deku scrub sat up, his head bare of any hat. The long green funnel was folded neatly in one of the dresser's drawers. It didn't fit him anymore, so it didn't make sense to let it drag on the village ground all day. His messy, blonde bedhead was no different from his human form, though it now rested over tired orange eyes. He slipped off the bed and his short legs went quite a distance before landing on the floor. He stretched, his arms extended as far as they could go, not quite making it past the top of his head. The equivalent of a human yawn escaped his snout. Link wandered over to the dresser and pulled out a pair of small leather boots next to his hat. This had been he and Tattle's other luxury purchase. The boots were toddler-sized. Custom made, because apparently no one that small needs practical boots, Link thought. He opened the top drawer next, scooped out a red rupee, put on his shoes, and left his hotel room, passing by the woman pacing outside his doorway. She was tall, red-headed, and wore a white leotard, clearly deep in thought. Her head turned to watch Link as he passed by. He'd gotten used to the stairs by now. Deku Scrubs must not come to Clock Town very often. When he made it to the lobby, the first thing he noticed was the absence of yesterday's innkeeper. Instead, a middle-aged woman with dark red hair was in her place. She bared a striking resemblance to the younger clerk from earlier. Good morning, she said in a rough, yet kind voice to the Deku Scrub. I hope you had a wonderful night here at the Stockpot Inn. Mm, thank you. Link responded, noticing a definite improvement in his speech. He completed his journey across the wooden floor and hopped up to the open door. You're welcome, she added with a smile. Though when he left the lobby and closed the door behind him, he heard what might have been a delayed gasp. <gasps> yeah, that really didn't sound like thank you, did it? Rain still came down lightly as the gray skies of Clocktown spared its inhabitants from the sun's fierce glare. Link took in Clocktown much less wondrously than he had the day before. When he looked up at the dark sky, he expected the hotel's roof to still blot out the moon, but that was no longer the case. That evil face was now closer than ever before, visible even from below the front door's awning. Link backed up slowly in awe. It's right over the clock tower, Link realized. What if it doesn't stop? Scary, huh? The Deku scrub turned to find two women and a child. The young child's hand was clutched tightly in one of theirs. Link nodded gravely. I'd leave if I were you, the other woman cautioned. My family and I come here every year for the carnival, but not with that thing here. It's going to fall. There's no doubting it. She looked over to her family and then back at the Deku scrub. 
The mayor still hasn't ordered an evacuation, but I'm not waiting for him to. She bid him one last farewell before heading to South Clock Town. Good luck to you, if you're staying. Link had no response. The main market district, East Clock Town, was practically a ghost town today. The words of the man under the tower returned to him. Except, the one thing is, I'm a very busy fellow, and I must leave this place in three days. That might be all the time left, Link thought grimly. 136, and he'd accomplished absolutely nothing. He discovered the shattered Great Fairy over 24 hours ago, and he was nowhere closer to finding the missing fragment. There Link stood, wandering around the clock tower behind the ramp. He found himself in the plaza again soon, amazed at how diligently the carpenters kept working, regardless of the moon. He continued walking until he noticed a Deku flower beside a shop stall. Has that always been there? He wondered. He never noticed it until now. The stall looked relatively well attended and ready for use, despite its empty shelves. Behind it and up against the city wall, the grand flower boasted nothing but magnificence. It was multi-layered and a pale shade of yellow, and the tiny opening in between the stall and wall hid it rather well. Link quickened his pace to approach it. However, he hardly made it five steps before someone above him shouted, Wait, wait, hang on! Link stopped short and turned to see a Deku scrub flying into the square. A helicopter of green leaves spun from the top of his head and kept him afloat. He was obviously an adult Deku scrub, carrying many large, heavy bags under his arms. He descended toward the abandoned stall, and no one else seemed to notice or care but Link. The adult Deku scrub's dangling feet barely missed the young scrub's head. Then, he was behind the stall and inside of the Deku flower, burrowing naturally inside of its depths. Wow, that does look weird, Link thought. Tattle must have been just as disturbed watching him do it yesterday. The adult Deku scrub's head popped out of the hole, keeping his luggage and his lower body hidden. He turned to the child from beside the shadows of the empty stall. This is my private property, he said, sounding slightly annoyed. Don't try using it when I'm not around. The last thing I need is a bunch of kids tearing it up while I'm gone. I really think it's ours. Because I have the title to this flower. Beauties like this don't remain public property for long, he said. Does he understand me? Link thought incredulously. The adult spoke quite articulately himself. Look at what a perfect position it is. The middle of Clock Town, the biggest village in Termina. I can easily fly to the top doors of the clock tower when the bell strikes midnight the day after next, and it's still secluded behind this store, which I happily use as my own shop. Why would I give it up to someone like you for free? Uh-huh. I know you're going to take it, Link added, trying his best to match the adult's speech. He failed, looking away from the adult Deku scrub to hide his embarrassment. The adult tilted his head curiously. Are you sick of something? You sound like you can barely talk. I heard an Deku roll, Link exclaimed suddenly, excitement building inside of him when he realized something. I can finally explain my entire situation to him, everything! No one else in town understood him enough to know he was actually a human. This is my chance, Link thought. He took a deep breath. Let all in as a magic well and a learn into a Deku room. I'm an Uman! The adult Deku scrub replied with blank, confused eyes. Link's heart sank. Not even another Deku scrub can understand my incoherent babble? Sure, sure, the adult eventually added. Whatever you say, but I wouldn't put all of your blame on the, uh... He raised his eyebrows slightly, as if still trying to piece it together. The fiery blue fern that gassed you? What? Hey, look, don't blame me. I can't understand half of what you're saying. Try talking more from your throat. You're trying to use the rims of your snout and your tongue too much, like a human would. 
Link paused for a moment, gathering his thoughts to follow those instructions. It is better? Yes, the adult said. Your last word almost sounded perfect. Link couldn't believe it. Speaking that way did feel a lot better. But, uh, before you leave, were you considering buying this property? Uh, no, he responded shakily, though still very high-pitched and unclearly. He was also confused by the scrub's change of heart. Just a few minutes ago, he'd been bragging about his prized possession. It's just that I've already sold out of my wares, and the carnival hasn't even begun, he explained, looking down sadly. Link only half paid attention as he continued thinking about this new method of talking, practicing on his own silently. I'm thinking of closing up shop so I can buy a gift for my wife and return to her in my village. When the adult Deku scrub looked up at Link for a response, Link quickly stopped talking to himself and pretended to have heard everything. Mm -hmm. Okay? He offered meekly. I've heard that a stone called the Moon's Tear shines brighter than any other in the land. If you've got one, I'd really like to get it from you. My wife would love it. If you give it to me, I'll give you my spot here. The young Deku scrub was suspicious. The flower did look rather appealing, and it was in a nice location. But do I really have time to ask around for a Moon's Tear? Uh, Deku flower included. The adult Deku scrub added hopefully, seeing the doubt in Link's face. The young Deku scrub, after a moment's consideration, shook his head, missing the weight of his long green hat when he did. No time! Link added squeakily. The adult paused before he said anything else, obviously disappointed. Ah, too busy looking for the antidote to the fiery blue fern's poisonous vapors, huh? Link nodded enthusiastically and took his chance to walk away. The adult sighed and returned to his flower. Link passed the miniature tower's construction in the square, stopping in front of the nearby bright red mailbox. Its hut-like roof was taller than him, just like everything else. Link sighed, realizing that if he looked for a moon's tear, he'd at least have something to do. He had no leads to follow and today was almost over. Rain came down lightly again as he looked at the town gate, wondering what Tattle was doing out there right now. When he turned back to the mailbox, he noticed the alleyway behind it for the first time. Didn't that boy with the purple hair and the fox mask come from there? Now that Link considered it, it didn't appear to lead to North, East, or West Clock Town. Is there a whole new area? Link walked to the person nearest him. The stall owner appeared to be packing all of her items hastily and didn't even notice the scrub. Hey! Link called out. She jumped in surprise, but went right back to packing. Oh, hello, little guy, she said. Sorry, but I'm closing. I can't help you. No, Link answered, pointing to the tall, narrow alleyway behind the post box. What's there? Oh, she exclaimed. That's the laundry pool and the back door to the curiosity shop. Not exactly anything there you'd be interested in. What? Link stopped himself before he made the same mistake again. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome? The alleyway didn't turn out to be very long, but it did cut through the thickness of the city wall until it reached another walled area. It was separated from South Clock Town and smaller than any of the other sections. A dirt road led from the alleyway and crossed a man-made stream of water. The current flowed directly between two grates on opposite town walls, likely connecting to the clock tower. On Link's side of the stream, there was neatly cut grass and a small tree surrounded by flowers. A stone bridge near a bench connected the dirt paths on either side. It was the only way to cross the stream, as far as Link could tell. The other side offered nothing but the backside of a shop and its door. The curiosity shop, Link remembered. He was the only one there. He wandered around this small, yet pretty area. There was nothing for him to do as the shopkeeper had tried to tell him. Link walked to the edge of the water and peered into its depths at his shimmering reflection, tired of the sad, pathetic Deku scrub returning his gaze. He walked over to the bench and sat down, putting his head in his hands. 
Small drops of rain fell into his short, blonde hair as he moped. <laughs> How am I supposed to defeat the Skull Kid in a day and a half? He was a Deku scrub who was incapable of protecting himself, let alone attacking, and as far as he could tell, that wasn't changing anytime soon. Link looked up when he heard footprints coming down from the alleyway. The innkeeper from earlier, the young woman that hadn't been there this morning, walked into the laundry pool. She had an umbrella open over on her head and wandered to the edge of the water. She peered across its surface and looked around the grassy area, as if confused, lost, not sure if she should be there. The lady then closed her eyes, took a deep breath, and sighed. <sighs> she walked slowly to the bench, sitting beside the Deku scrub, umbrella still over her head. The child looked up at her curiously, and she smiled down weakly in return. Hello, she said. <gasps> Link replied. He wasn't sure what to say. She still seems so familiar, Link thought, but he couldn't place it. Though as far as Link could tell, she didn't know him either. The woman turned away for a moment, mouth slightly open, as if wanting to say something but not quite sure how to word it. Excuse me for asking, but have you seen anyone since you've been sitting here? Link shook his head. It took her a while to say anything after that. The rain was the only thing that filled the moment of silence. The two merely sat in each other's company, Tiku Scrub and Human. He has short, black hair. A tall man. That's about my age. You haven't seen anyone? Link shook his head again. Lucy. He disappeared about a month ago with his wedding ceremony mask, she answered. I... Link watched her stammer, trying to hide the tears pooling in her eyes. I'm actually afraid to meet him, to hear why he wanted to disappear. And I can't keep waiting for a cafe like this. There are only two days until the carnival. Then she looked back to the Deku scrub, as if just now realizing he'd been patiently listening. I I'm so sorry, she said, wiping away the tears. Her other hand still held the rod to her umbrella. She quickly recomposed herself. I... I didn't mean to bother you, but I just thought you might have seen him here. It's okay. Link reassured her, trying his best to smile. She returned it. Thank you for listening. She reached for a name. Mr. Ink, was it? Link took in a deep breath, hoping it would finally, after all this time, come out right. Link! That correction was insignificant to her, but for Link, it was liberating. Finally, he'd revealed his true identity. Oh! The lady exclaimed. I must have written your name down wrong. Sorry about that. At least my mistake didn't end up giving someone else your reservation. About that, Link thought, though he kept it to himself. My name's Anju, she added. It was very nice to meet you, Link. It felt nice hearing his name again. You too! The two sat in silence for a moment longer, successfully ending the conversation on a positive note. Each remained occupied by their own thoughts until Anju spoke hers aloud. Do you think it's going to fall? Link didn't need her to clarify. All he had to do was look up to know what she was talking about. It was still there, as close as ever, but he had no real answer to her question. I don't know if I should leave, Anju said. A lot of people already have. They think it's going to fall on the carnival, but I don't want to leave if Cafe is still waiting for me. But the moon scares me. Link nodded solemnly wondering whether he should consider evacuating himself. A familiar noise interrupted their conversation. It was a sort of twinkling, chime-like sound that faded quickly, but it was filled with some characteristic of life. Tattle? Link said, jumping down from the bench. Anju watched as Link ran to the edge of the water. Link quickly found the source. It wasn't Tattle, but it had been a fairy. 
This particular fairy was too large to be concealed in its ball of light, orange-tinted, and fluttered quietly to itself in the shadows of the bridge. It only took him only a moment for him to make the connection, and then his heart raced with excitement. It's not over yet! Link ran onto the bridge and dropped to his knees, bringing his head toward the surface of the water. He stopped when he could clearly see the fairy underneath the bridge. The fairy turned around, obviously frightened by him. It's okay! Link said, taking one hand off the bridge to gesture her closer. His knee slipped, and Link gasped as he brought his arm back to stop himself from falling. Can Deku Scrub swim? He wondered. Link? Anju said nervously, standing from the bench. Link ignored her, awkwardly clinging to the bridge's edge. His head dangled over the shimmering, low-current water. He could see straight through the bottom of the man-made stream. It was probably four feet deep, which was an abyss to a small child. Link made one final attempt to talk to the fairy. This mistake, however, cost him dearly. The fall was short and quick, and Link went headfirst into the water. When he hit the surface, his body flattened itself so that he was lying on his back. He thought he would float at first, as if a piece of driftwood, but that experience didn't last very long. The rest of his body sank first, and soon only his bulbous head stayed afloat. His snout was halfway into the water, though, and the stream rushed inside, filling him and weighing him down. The Deku scrub sank to the bottom before he could react. Link stretched his tiny arms out for the bank of the stream, but he was already too far down. His arms didn't even reach past his head. Soon, his body turned upside down, as his head became the anchor that prevented him from swimming. He kicked his legs and arms to no avail. The shimmering surface of the water, whose small puddles of rain were interrupted by his large bubbles of air, gave way to the view of the stony, grimy bottom. Uh, I'm drowning, Link realized. No matter how hard he tried to remain conscious, tried to kick his legs, tried to fight the nausea, he found that he could only accomplish less and less. His muscles were only allowing him to do so much. Then the nausea increased as he abruptly rose to the top. When he broke the surface of the stream, the first thing he expected was to breathe. Anju pulled him out of the water, but the water was still unable to leave his snout. Link was outside of the stream and still drowning, still half unconscious, still hardly able to see amidst the fuzzy white light filling his vision. Anju laid his limp body on the grass and turned him over onto his side. Water quickly rushed out onto the dry grass. Link coughed and spat. <coughs> <coughs> as the stream left his lungs and his whole body lurched with the effort. Anju knelt with him on the grass as Link coughed on his hands and knees. Are you okay? she asked. <coughs> Link, still breathing in deeply, managed to nod. He turned around to sit beside her. Thank you, <coughs> Link said, realizing that was the clearest he'd ever spoken. Even though his throat was sore, it was now moist, too. He'd taken a few sips of water since his entry to Clock Town, but he never realized how much drinking made it easier to speak as a Deku scrub. That could have ended badly. What were you looking at? Anju's question was answered when the fairy tentatively flew out from under the bridge. Its orange body hovered gracefully over the water, now in between them both. Please. The fairy spoke much more beautifully than Link's high-pitched Deku scrub wails. Anju watched with interest, remaining curled up on the grass beside the two smaller beings. Hear my plea! The great fairy! <coughs> Link said, as if hoping this would explain things. The fairy did not seem to understand, and neither did Anju. The masked skull kid broke me apart and scattered my pieces. Please, return me to Fairy Fountain in North Clock Town. She seemed afraid to fly out in the open, and Link thought he knew why. When he turned to look at the moon, the fairy did too. She let out a small squeak and flew behind Link, <gasps> cowering in fear from its all-seeing gaze. The moon has the skull kid's eyes. Link turned pitifully to the small creature, smaller and more defensive than even himself. Who is 
the Skull Kid? asked Anju. Is he the one who's making the moon fall? Link nodded, and the fairy behind him made a noise that seemed to confirm this. Mm. I need to take her to the fountain, Link said to Anju. Okay, Anju said. She might have been disappointed that he was leaving, but she didn't show it. Link jumped to his feet and took a few steps toward the alleyway as the shock from his near-death experience faded. The fairy followed closely behind him, making sure to always block the moon out with the Deku scrub's body. Link turned back to face Anju before he left. She was still on her knees at the edge of the water. I look for coffee too, Link said, making Anju smile slightly. I will help you as soon as I talk the old I appreciate that, Anju said. She looked at the umbrella she dropped next to the bench, still fully open. Her hair was damp from the rain, but only the lower half of her arms were wet from pulling Link out of the water. He watched her smile fade as she remained kneeling at the water by herself. I wish I could help you right now, Link thought, but I'll come back after I stop the Skull Kid. I'm not useless. I'm not useless. I can do this by myself. Link happily ran through the grassy cave entrance, plunging into the darkness that immediately gave way to the fairy fountain's light. The orange fairy flew past him to immediately rejoin the others. Now that the moon was no longer in sight, there was nothing for her to fear. The fairy seamlessly included the stray into their flight pattern as if she'd never left. The ball they were making became smaller and denser until only one singular light was discernible. Then it exploded into a mass array of light, momentarily blinding Link. He blinked past that quickly to see what happened next. One much larger fairy grew from the explosion, laughing merrily. <laughs> her arms stretched outward to defy her confinements. She had long orange hair that floated as if underwater. The great fairy was bare of any clothing, her pale skin naked except for the vines loosely covering her. She relaxed to float in the air a few feet above the water. She seemed to be resting on an invisible bed, her arms supporting her head as she looked down on Link. The same way the Skull Kid floated, he noted. When he mocked Abona and cursed me. Though great fairies like this were not new to Link, they were all over Hyrule. <laughs> Young one of the altered shape. The orange-haired great fairy began. Thank you for returning my broken and shattered body to normal. Finally, Link thought, someone knows I'm supposed to be a human. He tried to ignore a hopeful, intrusive thought that seemed premature. Can she return me to normal? I am the great fairy of magic. I thought the matched child was helping me, and I grew careless. Magic! Link thought happily. A smile spread on the rims of his snout. All I can offer you is this. I shall grant you magical power as a sign of my gratitude. Please accept it. The great fairy held out her hands, cupping them together, palm up. Link waited for something to happen, but when nothing did, he opened his mouth to clarify. Then he was lifted off his feet before he could, and Link floated slowly upward. An orange light spiraled down from the black darkness of the ceiling, summoning him skyward. He grew dizzy and faint. His mind went numb as the light overpowered him. The invisible force gently placed him back on the ground in a matter of seconds, and the light faded with the dizziness. He felt incredible as soon as the queasiness subsided. A new power felt like it had been granted to him. He felt it coursing through his small body. For the first time, he felt happy and content in his Deku scrub form. I know why Tattle left you, and why you doubt yourself. The great fairy but said, trust me when I say that you have more power than you know, a power that the darkness and the mask the Skull Kid wears cannot possibly fathom. My magic power will help you while you are in your cursed form, but it in no way compares to the magic you possess. Link nodded, but didn't understand. 
This power feels much better than anything I have. She must have seen the doubt in his eyes and did not press the matter the further. The man who lives in the observatory outside of town may know of the Skull Kid's whereabouts, but be careful. You must not underestimate the dark powers of the mask. They will try to destroy you, and if they fail in doing so, corrupt you. If ever you are returned to your former shape, come see me. I shall give you more help, but I can do no more than that. The Skull Kid is far more powerful than I feared, and my magic is nothing against his. And then she threw her arms into the air again and laughed, growing smaller until she disappeared in a flash of orange light. <laughs> She left no stray fairies behind. If ever you are returned to your former shape. Link looked down into its reflection, hoping he would see blue eyes looking back at him. But they were still orange. Link turned away from the fountain and left for North Clock Town's field. He passed through the cave's dark entryway and then was once again in the sunlight, fiercer now that it was setting. It had broken through the clouds. The back of the clock tower was unable to tell him what time it was. Link looked down at his hands again, wondering what his new power was. I don't look any different, even though I feel different. The small Deku scrub walked down the slope thoughtfully, not sure how he was supposed to get outside of town. Huh, she told me to go to the observatory. Tattle said the guards wouldn't let him leave, but Link decided to test that theory. He walked across the grassy field toward the town gate, his long spear standing beside him. His eyes were hidden in the shadows of his visor, metal armor shiny in the light of the sun. Link only came up to his thigh. Have you some errand in the mountains? The guard asked as soon as Link approached. The Deku scrub was intimidated by his deep, commanding voice, but he nodded anyways. I didn't realize there were mountains nearby. It's dangerous outside the town walls, so I cannot allow a child like you to pass through here. Return once you are old enough to carry a weapon and can defend yourself. A child like you? I'm not a child! Link exclaimed angrily, but the squeakiness of his voice reminded him that he was. Go find your parents before I bring you back to them. A child your age shouldn't be running around unprotected. I'm not defenseless! Link yelled, but when he reached for the sword behind his back, it wasn't there, and his hand felt empty and defeated once it came back to rest in front of him. <clears throat> Look, Link continued, clearing his throat. I'm trying to stop the moon from falling. I need to leave Clock Town to do that. Well, the guard began, smiling down at the child. The moon's over there, Tyke, above the clock tower. You're going the wrong way. No! I need to find the man who's doing this to the moon. He's not here in Clock Town. A man is doing this. How does a man fly into the sky and put a face on the moon? He has an evil mask. Look, I have magic powers from the Great Fairy. I can stop him. The guard laughed. <laughs> Look, I don't have time to waste talking to little children. Go play with the other kids unless you can lift me into the air and move me with your magic powers. Link didn't reply to that. He stormed off back towards South Clock Town. It turned out learning to speak wasn't the ticket to freedom he'd imagined. At first, he didn't notice the children spying on his conversation, but he saw them snickering and whispering to each other as soon as he left the guard. There were five of them. They're the kids from yesterday. Hey, hey you! It was the voice of the red-hatted, red-shirted one, who was the leader of their little gang. He was probably only seven years of age. Link kept walking and ignored them. Stop! Link didn't until the kid jumped in front of him. The look of anger he gave the guard only intensified. Go away, Link said. Make me, he said. You have magic powers, don't you? He laughed, and the other blue-hatted, blue-shirted kids surrounding him laughed, too. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't even have a bloom. <laughs> <laughs> Only old people can do magic. Or is that fairy going to stop us? The leader asked. 
The monster fairy! exclaimed one of the other kids behind him. Ah! She almost ate my face off last time! I saw its teeth! added another one. I don't have time for you snot-nosed little kids! Link exclaimed. Get out of my way before I make you move! Do it! the leader added, and the other kids oohed and awed. Oh! Ooh. Ho ho! Link didn't know how he did it, but he discovered his new powers. The leader's face showed absolute disgust when a thick, green bubble formed at the scrub's mouth. Link's face was contorted in anger, frustration, and concentration as it grew rapidly. The bubble stayed there for a moment, shaking back and forth madly once it reached its capacity. It was perhaps as large as Link's head, and when he stopped blowing, it whistled and released like an untied balloon with precision. It hit the grass at the kids' feet, exploding to send green goop in all directions. The kids managed to jump back at the last second, but their eyes remained fixed in horror of the unknown slimy substance in the grass. For a second, no one said anything. Then... That was so awesome! Yeah! He shot a magic poison ball at you! He is a magician! But he is not old! The leader of the gang, now separated from Link by the puddle on the ground, looked up at the Deku scrub. The other kids stood behind him in awe. Not bad for a Deku scrub. Link almost smiled with pride, but he managed to keep a straight face. He wasn't sure what just happened, and was mildly disgusted. We bombers have a hideout in the alleyway in East Clocktown. It leads to the observatory outside of town. You need a code to get in, though. The red-hatted kid looked behind himself to the blue-hatted ones. Should we tell him? They seemed to think about it for a moment, but they didn't hesitate with their answer. No, no way, Jim! Jim. No, no scrubs. scrubs! The red-hatted kid, Jim, turned back to face Link. If only you were human, then I can make you a member. Once, we let some kid who wasn't human join our gang, and boy did we regret it. <laughs> it was bad. He tried to eat my face off, explained one of the kids behind Jim. I saw his teeth! Uh... Where'd you say the hideout was? Link asked. He didn't need the bomber's approval, and he was done with this conversation. If there was a secret hideout, he wagered there weren't any guards nearby. Uh, East Clocktown? Jim stammered. It's through that doorway just over there. He pointed to one of the three official openings on the city wall. You can't miss it. But why are you asking us? We just told you, you need a code to get in. And you don't have it. Yeah, whatever. The Deku scrub said, turning around to leave his pile of goop behind. Hey! Jim called out. Where are you going? Link never responded. The moon urged him onward. As he'd feared, it was closer than ever before. The orange sunset was faint on its dark gray rock. Three days. The first one had passed with no progress, but the second one got better every hour. A yellow-hatted child guarded the secret passageway. They were on the elevated section of East Clocktown, behind the hotel. There were other buildings up here as well, and the secret entrance was an alleyway crammed between two of them. Its floor descended on a rather steep slope into what looked like complete darkness. This kid was all that stood in Link's way. Um... You need a secret code? The kid repeated yet again, raising his eyebrows. I'm not letting you through until you give it to me. Link chose to stand there in silence, a blank expression on his face as he stared. Is this kid serious? What? Why are you looking at me like that? Jim told me to stay here and not let anyone through. Link didn't say or do anything. Hey, you're creeping me out. I'm not letting you in. If you try... I'm gonna knock you out and get a guard to come and take you back to your parents so you can... can... take a nap. Still, Link held his composure and did not blink. I'm going to tell you one last time. Get out of my face or I'll... A dense light green bubble flew from his snout, except this time, it landed on the chest of his target. 
The kid's face went wide with shock as his entire body was drenched in thick, green smudge. He screamed as the excess muck oozed off him and collected on the floor. He brought his hands to his face to try and get it off, but there was too much. My eyes! <laughs> he ran from his post, hands over his face, back through the doorway and into North Clock Town. Link smiled, confident that no one else had seen that. The Deku scrub continued onward into the alleyway's depths, finally past the dreaded walls that blocked everything from view, but underground. And it could not have been darker. He walked carefully to avoid tripping. Just when you start to take a fairy's life for granted, Link realized. The tight space quickly became disconcerting. The tunnel was hardly large enough even for his small, cursed form. As it cut deeper into the wall and further underground, space became scarcer. The stone walls, ceiling, and floor were wet and covered in some sort of slime or plant growth. When the ground leveled out, Link was surprised to find a torch blazing a few feet off. The firelight revealed a stone platform that went on for only a few feet, boxed in by walls and a much higher ceiling. He was definitely underground, and this was clearly a sewer system. The platform ended at another man-made stream, except this stream was much wider and slightly deeper. It was the only way forward. On the other side was a ledge, but there was no discernible way to cross. The path on the other side promised to lead to this mysterious person in an observatory. Though the water wasn't as clean as the laundry pools, it was filth-ridden, green-tinted, and mixed with things better left unsaid. No one's here to help me if I start drowning this time, Link thought. He decided against going back for help. Anju has enough on her mind, and... Why would anyone want to help a defenseless Deku scrub cross a dangerous pool of disease-ridden water? He had to do this alone. He remembered falling off the bridge trying to capture the attention of the stray fairy. At first, he'd been a piece of driftwood in the water. My body almost wanted to float, Link recalled. It wasn't until his snout filled with water that his porous body absorbed all of it. Can I skip across the surface just long enough to reach the other side? Eventually, a loss of momentum and gravity would pull him into the water, but perhaps he could go long enough to make it. Link took a deep breath, taking a few steps back from the edge of the water and preparing himself. Then his little legs sprinted for the stream. He leapt low and far. The moment his feet touched the water, he met resistance instead of sinking. His toes only went a few inches under before he could kick back out and hop forward. More Deku scrub superpowers, he realized. The next jump went the same as the first. His feet hardly dipped in and he was able to hop off the water like a solid object. As he came down for his third jump, he panicked when his feet went further in. Link was still able to kick back out of it, but this time with much less success. The fourth hop was worse than the third. The first jerk of his legs didn't bring him out of the water at all, but the second did. He was now only one more good jump away from the other side. The fifth he thought would be the worst of them all, but Link mustered all the strength he could to leap the rest of the way. His arms reached out for the shallow end, but he came just short of it. Link plunged into the water instantly. He tried not to panic. This time, the ledge he needed to grab onto wasn't so far away. Link's snout instantly filled with water, but he brought his arms up to grab the ledge before he sunk too far past. He climbed out of the sewer water and crawled across the stone floor, bending over to spit the murky green liquid out. His lungs heaved with the effort, as they had at the laundry pool, and soon he was taking in massive gulps of dark sewer air. <coughs> I, I did it! Link realized. I survived by myself as a Deku scrub. <sighs> However, his celebration didn't last long. He felt the presence of another living creature in the room. His heart stopped 
Link quickly got to his feet and turned around. The sewer continued left until it turned at a hard angle through another doorway. He ran quickly in that direction, not sure if he was quite ready to fight, but before he could make it, what looked like a giant skull descended from the ceiling and stopped him. Link ran right into it. The giant monster spun, hitting him and sending Link hurtling across the walkway. <laughs> the scrub rolled several feet onto his back, but this time, he couldn't lie down and recuperate. Link jumped to his feet with what little strength he had left. A sculptula had fallen from a nook in the ceiling. A man-sized spider. Its eight long legs came out from its black body, though its back was colored as if it were the face of a skull. The spider landed on its legs, looking at the Deku scrub with red predator's eyes, taller than the child, even on its stomach. Link made an involuntary whimpering sound. <laughs> The two animals stared at one another, two orange eyes looking fearfully at the many red ones. The Sculptula made the first move, charging at the defenseless Deku scrub. The spider was surprised when a thick bubble flew from its prey's mouth, threatening to coat it in an odorous, speed-inhibiting liquid. The spider, with sickening agility, avoided it and continued its approach. Link took steps backward, not daring to turn around, and fired a second bubble. This time, he considered the spider's speed, and the attack splattered all over its white backside. However, that side, posing as a skull, was also as thick as one. The bone on its back was unaffected by the globs of green, and it continued onward until it reached the astonished Deku scrub. Link brought up his arms to defend himself, but the superior, longer and stronger spider leg hit him in the gut in a single swoop. The Sculptula slammed him into the wall, and Link fell, crumbling to the floor like a sack of twigs. Link struggled to get to his feet, but already the spider was upon him. It held him to the ground, easily, with two arms, its disgusting head coming closer to his own face. Thick, black fangs opened toward his neck. Link screamed and wailed! <coughs> Squirming in vain against the Sculptula, Link was forced to watch as its teeth came closer to his skin, its many red eyes blinking excitedly. When it took a bite, the sharp, piercing pain was followed by the creature's putrid stench and its tiny hairs brushing against his cheek. The Sculptula was so close he could hear it breathing heavily in glee over its new meal. <sighs> Link was only able to scream for a few seconds. <coughs> the venom acted almost instantaneously. Link squirmed his last squirms in the dark sewer. His limbs went limp, and his mind faded away. He had one final coherent thought. I hate being a Deku scrub!